coming to us today on the topic supply and demands supply and demands James chapter 4 verses 2 through 4 the King James text today reads ye lust and have not ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain ye fight and war yet ye have not because ye ask not ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lusts or upon your own desires ye adulterers and adulteresses know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Amen. I want to talk to us today on the topic supply and demands. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment please. James. 4, 2 through 4. Master, we love you, God. We thank you. King Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for the word of God. We thank you for the presence of God. We thank you, Lord, for the promise that one day, oh God, there will be no more sickness. There will be no more pain. There will be no more parting, no more death, nor sorrow. For the former things will have passed away, and all things will be made new. Master, right now the Word of God is broken open and the servant of God stands before you humbly in the sacred desk asking, O oh Lord, that you would anoint, that you would touch my feeble lips of clay. Allow me to deliver a word from the Lord to the people of God that they might receive proper instruction. And that in this instruction they might find blessing and benefit and favor. Master, in the name of Jesus, touch the ear of every hearer. Prepare our hearts to receive from your word at this hour. Lord, let me not deliver the opinions, the thoughts of men. But rather, O oh God, let me as a prophet of God declare, thus saith the Lord. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. I don't know if there has ever been a time in human history when believers have fought harder and worked harder to obtain the things that this world has to give and to achieve success and status and promotion. I don't know if there's a time in the history of the church when God's people, especially and particularly in America, have been more caught up in these endeavors than they are today. And it was James, the brother of Jesus, who addressed this subject in our primary text today, he said, Ye lust, meaning you want, you desire. He said, and yet you don't have. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. We got people today who will in theory, kill to achieve their goal, you know. They'll do anything it takes. They'll do anything that they have to do in order to make a few extra bucks, in order to get that promotion at work, in order to achieve that next uh, level of success, in order to put that much more money in their bank account. They're willing to do anything and everything they possibly can in order to have the things that they desire, the things this world offers, and yet 
The Apostle James says, the brother of Jesus, he said, and yet with all this, you still can't lay your hands on it. You fight and war, yet you have none. He said, for all your struggle, <laughs> for all your sacrifice, for all your effort, you still don't have what you desire to have. And then he tags a line on that says, you have, yet you have not, listen, because ye ask not. What's the reason believers don't have today? Well, the reason they don't have is because they're not asking. But then he goes on to say, ye ask and receive not. Oh my word. Now wait a minute, James, you just said the reason we don't have is because we don't ask. Now in the very next breath you say, and when we do ask, we're still not receiving. Oh my goodness. So there are those believers today, Tommy, who are struggling and fighting and warring and sacrificing and doing everything in their power to obtain, and yet they're not obtaining because they never once have stopped and talked to the Lord about it. They never asked God to help them in their endeavors. Yet, there are those believers who have stopped, who have asked, who have inquired of the Lord. And they still have not received. Oh my goodness. Why? James said, because ye ask amiss. See, the biggest problem we have with unanswered prayer is not that God doesn't hear. It's not that the enemy's fighting. It's not that the devil's preventing your prayer from getting higher than the ceiling. No, that's not the problem. The problem is that our prayer is uh, falling to the ground because it's nowhere near anything that God's interested in hearing. Oh my goodness. You can stand there and beg and plead and ask God for things of this world. Ask God for all the material blessing that this world has to offer. And I've got news for you, honey. He is not listening. He's not interested in that prayer. That has absolutely nothing in it that is of interest to God. God is not in the genie business. God is not in the wish granting business. God is not there to give you everything every cotton pick and foolish thing that you desire. James said, ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss, listen, that ye may consume it upon your own lusts. Said, in other words, the motivation behind that thing you're asking for is simply that you want it. How many of us go to God in prayer and we ask the Lord for things. And if we really step back for a minute and examined the motivation for what we're asking for, we would find that the only motivation we have is we want it. Do we need it? No. We don't need it. We want it. Is it going to help us in our walk with God? Is it going to help us serve the Lord? Is it going to help us have a better testimony? Is it going to help us win the lost? These are all things we ought to be concerned about, but most of us do things without a thought in the universe as to whether or not, uh, you know, those issues, as if those issues don't even exist. I know for me personally, I can't even buy a car. Except that as I'm buying a car, I'm thinking, will I be able to carry people to church in this car? Will I be able to carry people? Am I going, are they going to be able to get in? And am I telling the truth? And are they going to be able to get in and out easily? I'd love to have me a little sports car. I'd love to have me, you know, some of these fancy little cars that are out there. I'd love to have me a Mustang 5.0. I'd love to have a lot of these things. They're lovely. They're beautiful. They're fun to drive. But they're also impractical when it comes to doing anything for the Lord. And I've got new for you. Everything I do is, is moderated. Everything I do uh, has contingencies attached to it because 
I want to be able to do for God. I want to be able to do for the kingdom of the Lord in everything I do. I don't even buy expensive suits. I don't buy expensive shoes. You don't see this preacher wearing any rings on his fingers or bells on his toes. You don't see me wearing uh, French cuff shirts with cufflinks that cost $400 or more. You don't see that with this preacher, and I'm going to tell you why. Not because I belong to First Holiness Church, and they claim that these things are mandatory, that you've got to follow this set of rules and this set of regulations. No, no, no. I embrace those standards because as a preacher of the gospel, I think it's ignorant and stupid for a pastor to get up in a pulpit with a big old thousand dollar ring shining on his finger when there are people in the sanctuary who are going to have to go home and they're going to have to scrub through their cabinets and scrub through their pantry to try to find a meal. Pastor, that's not likely to happen. Oh yeah, it is, honey. I grew up that way. I know what I'm talking about. I remember going to church. Now, my pastors didn't wear, you know, a lot of bejewels and stuff like that. I'm not saying they did, but I'm saying that I remember going to church and seeing evangelists and visiting preachers and different ones on television, and they got their big sparkling diamonds, and they're wearing their $1,000 suits and their $600 shoes. And there my mother and my brothers and I are having to scrape together some macaroni and tomato soup so we can make a meal. I think it's sinful. I think it's stupid. I don't believe for one minute that God's people are called to live lavishly. I don't believe for one minute that God's people are called uh, to live these ostentatious lives. No, we're supposed to be a people of compassion. We're supposed to be a people of uh, with giving hearts. And therefore, everything I do, everything I do is contingent upon whether or not it serves not only my purpose but God's purpose as well. Do you hear what I'm telling you today? People often confuse the concept of the Lord's helping them with the notion of the Lord's doing for them. The promise of God is this. He is ever present to help us in times of trouble. Sometimes that help will come in the form of support, meaning strength, endurance, patience. And sometimes God's help will come in the form of supply. And that's when the Lord simply puts what we need in our possession, puts it right in our hand. The Lord doing for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Now don't, don't get it confused. God today does not facilitate sin. He does not facilitate laziness. He does not facilitate slothfulness. He does not facilitate dishonesty or theft. That's an example. He also desires that we grow and we become the best, listen, that we can be. And for this reason, He will often offer us assistance, listen, without simply providing that for which we are asking. So sometimes we go to the Lord and we say, Lord, I need money. I need more money than I've got. The Lord says, fine, here's some overtime. You hear me? No, Lord, I don't want overtime. I want a check. I don't want to have to work for it, Jesus. I just want you to send me a check. And I, I want to go to the mail. You know, that guy on TV promises if I drink his miracle water, that all of a sudden I'm going to get a big check in the mail. Mm-hmm. Well, i got news for you, honey. Sometimes God answers our prayer, but He answers it in the form of assistance rather than provision. You see, people think they can go to the Lord like this little girl in my illustration today, holding a toy up in front of her mother and making a demand, Mommy, buy this for me! We think we can go to God and say, Lord, I want this! I want that! We 
can make demands. And we think that's how it's supposed to work. I grew up in church. I hate to say it, but growing up as a kid, I thought if you tagged the words in Jesus' name on the end of something, that poof, it was magically going to appear in front of your eyes. It doesn't work that way. Ye ask and have not because you ask amiss. And why are you asking for it? Because you want it. That little girl don't need that toy. She wants that toy. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? There's a world of difference between our needs and our wants. It kills me how many people run around depressed and upset because they don't have everything they want. Listen to me, children. But if they would stop and look for a moment, they'd realize that God has met every one of their needs. Mm -hmm. They're not hungry. They're not naked. They're not homeless. They're not without an automobile. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? How amazing is it that people can get so upset because their wants aren't met, but their needs are. I know Christians who have left the church despondent and disgruntled, especially because they bought into this prosperity lie, the prosperity doctrine. And they become so despondent because God isn't giving them everything that they want like the preacher that they listen to told them he would. Parents sometimes who do their, who do their children's homework will find that they prevent their children from learning rather than assisting their child in doing so. Am I telling the truth? If I do my kid's homework for him, the kid ain't learning nothing. He may get an A, but he's getting an A for nothing because he hasn't done nothing. He hasn't learned nothing. He won't leave that experience. He won't leave that classroom having uh, attained any knowledge. And I'm here to tell you today that uh, helping your child with something is far better than doing it for them. When a child is completely unable to do something for themselves, well then it is perfectly understandable and appropriate that mom or dad would do it for them. Am I telling the truth? If a little child comes in three years old and asks mom to get them breakfast, well, that kid can't go fix his own breakfast. So obviously, at that point, dad or mom is going to have to provide, am I telling the truth? But if that child is 10 years old, mom and dad can go in the kitchen and say, here's the cereal, here's the milk, here's the bowls, here's the spoons, help yourself. That way... Tomorrow morning, you don't have to wake me up to come in here and do anything. Because instead of providing for you, I'm assisting you. Hello now. I'm teaching you. I'm here to tell you today, folks, a lot of people don't realize that part of what God is trying to do in our lives is teach us. Help us to be better. Help us to do better. You know, I'm going to say this, and, and probably it's going to fall very controversially on many ears. But I grew up in church where God help you if you ever said you did anything or you accomplished anything or you, you know, no, 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 you can't do that. Everything has to be, you have to give all the glory to God. And therefore, you cannot accept credit for anything. I've got news for you. I'm going to tell you a little secret. God doesn't want that. Said everything you do, do it for the glory of God. Yes, everything we do, we do for the glory of God. But that doesn't mean that there aren't many things, listen to me children, that we have done. Oh my goodness, I hope you're hearing me today. You see, God don't want His people walking around with their head bowed down, looking at the floor, feeling like garbage because they're so weak and stupid and they're so faulty and frail that they couldn't walk down the street if it wasn't for the Lord giving me the strength to walk down the street. Hallelujah, glory to God. But that's the image a lot of Christians portray to the world. 
everything is well, thank God. Yes, with God's help, I was able to do this. With God's help, I was able to do that. And uh, yes, that may be true with God's help. You were able. But see, there's a phrase in there that you seem to be mixing up and misunderstanding. With God's help, you were able. With Dad's help, little Johnny was able to make himself breakfast. But who made Johnny breakfast? God or Dad or Mom or Johnny? Johnny made himself breakfast. Johnny can go to Grandma and say, Grandma, I made myself breakfast this morning. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? God wants you to be able to take a certain amount of... Of pride, a certain amount of joy, a certain amount of self satisfaction in your accomplishment. He does. That's why he's there to provide assistance rather than provision. So that in the end, we can honestly say, Well, I did it. Needed to pay off my bills. God didn't send me a million dollar check to pay off my bills. But you know what he did do? He did allow me to have a good job, make a good living. He did open the door up for me to get some promotions and get some raises. He did open up some overtime. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? But in the end, who is it that paid your bills? You did it. And God wants you to be able to acknowledge and accept the fact that you did it. Because there is nothing wrong with feeling good about yourself. The Word of God tells us to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. The problem is most people don't love themselves. If you don't love yourself, I hate to quote RuPaul, but if you don't love yourself, how in the world are you going to be able to love anybody else? You cannot. A child can't be expected to cook their own meals, but they certainly can be taught to clean their own rooms. In 2 Thessalonians 3, 10 through 12, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, the Apostle Paul writes, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. Say, Pastor, why did you read that passage? Because I'm trying to help you understand why God sometimes does not supply, but rather He supports. Hello now. He provides support so that you can do for yourself what you need to do for yourself. Supply is spoken of in the Word of God. We have certain promises. Philippians 4.19 But my God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Your need, not your wants, your need. If you need it, God has promised He'd supply it. Does He supply it always by reason of plopping it down in front of you? Nope. Sometimes He offers support so that you can provide it for yourself. Am I telling the truth? Matthew 6.33 But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. In 1 John 5.14 and 15 And this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, the most important four words in that passage. According to His will, He heareth us. And if we know that He hear us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of Him. Oh my goodness. What does that mean? I'll tell you what it means. It means a lot of the things people are trying to believe God for, they shouldn't be trying to believe God for because they don't fall in with the will of God for their life, number one. 
And the things that we ought to be able to go to God with and have confidence knowing that without, beyond the shadow of a doubt, beyond a question, He will hear and answer that prayer. We don't believe God in those areas. Pastor, what do you mean? I'll tell you what I mean. How many Christians fall under a spirit of doubt and confusion? How many Christians fall under a spirit of condemnation and guilt when they do something or say something they ought not to have said or do something they ought not to have done or they sin or they, they act foolishly and yet the Word of God says if we confess our sins He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So what does that mean? Well that means God has promised that if we'll confess our sin, He'll forgive it. That's a promise. Therefore, if we go to God and we have sin to confess, is it the will of God to forgive that sin? Absolutely, because He said it is. You hear what I'm telling you? So the very thing people struggle with more than any other issue in the world. Can God forgive me of the horrible things I've done? Can God forgive me the terrible things I've said and the way I've hurt people and the sins that I've committed? The answer simply is yes! When you go to God, you can go boldly before the throne of grace. You can go boldly. Why? Because it's within His will to forgive. He has said so! And therefore, when you go to God seeking forgiveness, you shouldn't have a question in your mind whether or not God's going to forgive. It's forgiven. He said it. It is so. Now, if you go to God asking for a Cadillac, good luck with that. You go to God asking for a Mercedes, good luck with that. Go to God asking for a private plane, Mr. Trump, good luck with that. Those aren't things that we have the promise of God's Word, that we're able to go to God with a promise in hand and say, Lord, I know it's your will. There are people who say, I'm too evil, I'm too lost, I've been, I'm too far from God to be saved. The Word of God said, God is not willing, listen, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come unto repentance. So what does that mean, Pastor? That means that if you're unsaved, if you've never believed and obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter what you've done, where you've been, who you did it with, or how you did it. It doesn't matter what sins lie in your past. God is able and willing to forgive because it's not His will that any should perish, but rather it is His will that all should come under repentance. So if you turn to God with a penitent heart, He will will forgive and save. Hallelujah! You follow what I'm telling you now? Do you understand why it's so important that we pray according to the will of God and not merely according to the desires of our own flesh? In James chapter 4, the brother of Jesus told us that when we pray according to the desires of our own flesh, we're allowing the world a carnal mindset. My God, most of the church today is consumed by consumerism. It's consumed by a worldly spirit and a worldly mindset. It's all about having. It's all about wearing the nicest clothes and having the fanciest cars and owning the prettiest houses. Most people in the church today, that's how their minds work. And what did James say? James said that to have a desire for the things of this world means that your mind ain't right. You're not in the right place. As a matter of fact, friendship with the world, he said, is enmity against God. The minute you become friendly with the world, the minute you become friendly with what this world has to give, and you're more interested in living the best life you can live in the here and now, rather than living for God the best you can live for God, and letting Him bless you, letting Him, him pour out favor upon you. The more you're focused on this world, the more you're focused on the here and now, the more, listen to me children, the more you become the enemy of God. Whew, that's a powerful thought. That's a powerful thought. 
God has promised to supply when we are unable to do for ourselves. He said, if you're not able to do it for yourself, by all means, I will supply. As long as it's something you need. As long as it's something that falls within my will for your life. Now, provision... The Word of God promises provision, Psalm 46 and 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Philippians 4.13, listen carefully, believer, listen carefully. I can do. I'm going to be like some of these preachers on television. Say these three words with me. I can do. We read that passage and we read right through it because after all, we're not supposed to take any kind of credit. We're not supposed to acknowledge that we had anything to do with it. Oh no, all glory to God. Hallelujah, glory to God. I'm supposed to feel like a worthless worm who can't stand up in the morning without God's help. Hello now. No. The Word of God tells us, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. What does Christ do? Does he provide it for me? No. He strengthens me, listen to me, so that I can do it. Who's done it in the end? You've done it. How did you do it? With God's help. Hello now. Oh my goodness. Do you hear what I'm telling you? But who did it? You did it. Who does the apostle say can do all things? He said, I can do all things. Friend, I got news for you today. There's a whole lot in this life that you're capable of doing that you never thought you were capable of doing. Listen to me. I hope you're hearing me today. With God's help, you're far more capable than you ever thought you were. With God's help, there's a whole lot more you can accomplish in your life. There's a whole lot more you can achieve. There's a whole lot more you can do. I remember as a teenager moving to Texas, first job I got in Texas, I left Connecticut at 16 years old, moved to Texas at the direction of the Holy Ghost. I got a job at one point for a Safeway grocery store. My job up home in Connecticut, my first job was working as a checker in a grocery store. Well, at one point I got a job working at a Safeway in Fort Worth. The man I worked for, the manager, was a Baptist. And he hated Pentecostals with a passion, and he didn't hide it. He said it just straight out plain. I don't like Pentecostal. I don't like you Pentecostal. Oh, he used to give me such grief. One day he called me in the office and said, you talk too much at the register. You take too much time with the customers. He said, you need, to, you, know, you need to be ringing out a whole lot more in the course of your shift than you're ringing out. You know, right now you're ringing out, I'm going to say $1,000 a shift. You know, say you need to be at $3,000 a shift. I went home and I said, Lord, have mercy. First of all, I didn't talk a whole lot to the customers because I was trying to stay busy, you know. But this guy was trying to give me grief. Now, I can go home and whine and cry to God about how miserable this guy's being to me and how awful he's being to me. Lord, I wish you'd take him out. I wish you'd do. But you know what I did instead? I went to the Lord and I said, Lord, you promised that I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. So I'm not asking you to do anything with Him. I'm not asking you to do anything to Him. I'm asking you simply to give me the ability to do what I'm being asked to do. Guess what? The very next day I went to work, and by howdy, I did exactly what He asked me to do. I think I shocked the fire out of Him because He wasn't expecting it that fast. But I did it. I hope you heard me, children. I did it. Jesus didn't throw me off the register and start ringing groceries. No, no. I did it. I did it. I can take satisfaction. I can take pleasure. I can feel good about myself for having done it. Now, I feel like I needed God's help to do it. And somehow, some way, the Lord helped me, so I was able to do it. But I got it done. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? 
I'll tell you, there's nothing wrong with God's people feeling decent about themselves, feeling good about themselves. Sometimes the Lord gives us the strength or the ability to do something for ourselves. He desires that we be able to enjoy the success and achievement associated with the task at hand. Sometimes the Lord does things for us which are not even necessary. Things we don't necessarily need, but rather He does it as a demonstration of His love for us. Parents will give their kids gifts. It's not their birthday. It's not Christmas. It's not Easter. It's no holiday. But they'll bring a gift home for their child. Say, I was at the store and I saw this and I thought of you and I thought this is something you'd really enjoy. When I was a kid, I loved matchboxes. Matchboxes and Legos. Those were my two go-to toys. I love me some matchboxes. So if somebody wanted to make me happy, all they'd have to do is bring me a new matchbox or bring me another set of Legos and I was happy camper. Didn't have to be a holiday. Parents sometimes just bring things home, give it to the kids, say, I know you like this and I happen to see this. Am I telling the truth? I got news for you today, children. God is also a loving parent. There are times when the Lord will do things for us simply to demonstrate His love for us. So it's not always based on need, but the difference is we ask for our needs to be met and He's promised to meet our needs. Now, the things we'd like, we don't have to ask for. Oh my goodness. The things that don't fall into the need category, we don't have to waste God's time asking for those things. The Word of God said the Lord knows what we have need of before we even ask Him. God knows the desire of your heart. We don't even have to ask. I'll never forget years ago, I was in the process of starting my first apostolic work. I've told you all I had a friend, Sister Chambers, who was in her 80s, Holy Ghost filled lady. I mean, oh my goodness, she, she was an amazing woman. Uh, I wish, oh, I wish everybody could have known her. I wish you could have heard some of her testimonies. That lady had such a marvelous walk with God, such a marvelous testimony. But she and I were just real good friends. She's kind of my adopted grandma here in Texas when I was living out in East Texas. And I was looking for a place to start my first apostolic work. It was my third church but it was my first apostolic work. And one day I was visiting with Sister Chambers and she said, how are you doing? Looking for a place to start your church? I said, well, said, I, I'm not having great success. I said, I've looked at all kinds of places and storefronts and little buildings and this and that. I said, but I just can't find anything that is quite right, you know. She said, well, honey, she said, I've got a word from the Lord for you. I said, okay. She said, God spoke to me to tell you that he's got a building set aside for you and it's move-in ready. And she said, everything your heart's ever desired in a church, this building's got. She said, the Lord has seen your faithfulness. He has seen your struggle. He knows how hard you've tried to do for Him all these years and how much you've been through in your life, she said. And He spoke to me and said, I'm going to reward Him by giving Him a church. Just everything He's ever wanted, this property is going to have. said, it's going to have a sanctuary that will seat over 300 people. It's going to have a baptistry. It's going to have a piano and an organ. It's going to have Sunday school rooms and offices. It's going to have a separate fellowship hall apart from the sanctuary, apart from the church building. Now, how many churches do you ever see that even have a separate? But at that time, that was something I always wanted. I wanted the fellowship hall to be separate from the church building. I won't go into all my reasons for why I wanted this, but anyway, you know, I wanted it like that. 
And she went down this list. And I'm going to be honest with you. As she was speaking, I sat there and I had a big grin on my face. And I was thinking, bless her heart. She's being so sweet. She's, you know, she's trying to encourage me. She's trying to be sweet to me. But I didn't believe a word she was saying. Didn't believe a word she was saying. One a week later, so my brother Dallas, I was trying, I had him enrolled. He was living with me, and I had him enrolled in this Christian school, and it was run by this Baptist church. And one day he came to me and he said, The pastor, the, the uh, pastor of the church wants to see you. And I thought, Oh Lord, Dallas has gotten himself in trouble, you know. So I went into the pastor's office and of course it's a big Baptist church in East Texas and us Baptists and Pentecostals are not generally inclined to get along too well at least you know in my experience he said brother Charles I understand you're looking for a place to start a church I said well yeah I am he said well you know we had a Baptist church they built a building up here up the road a ways not quite 20 miles away. He said, it's kind of in the country a little bit. He said, but they built this building and then the church went defunct. He said, right now, there are a couple of people who have been appointed trustees over the building. And once a month, they conduct a sing-in at the property. And that's how they raise the money to just, you know, keep the building going and make sure it doesn't fall into decay and everything. He said, we hadn't had any success selling it or anything. He said, would you be interested in possibly renting it? I said, well, yeah, I'd certainly be interested in looking at it. I'd love to look at it. I, oh, part of my, i got to tell you the whole thing. Part of my wish list was the sanctuary had to have no windows. Riverside Church used to have no windows in their sanctuary, and I love that because we could shout and dance and have church all over the place and never had to worry about bothering the neighbors, you know. <coughs> so part of my thing was I wanted the building to have no windows. And I wanted red carpet and red pews. Why? Because growing up as a kid, that's what we had in the little church I grew up in. And I, just for nostalgia, I wanted red carpet and red pews. He said, well, here's the address. He said, meet us out there in about an hour and take a look at it and we'll see if it wouldn't serve your purposes. I drove out not quite 20 miles from that East Texas town I was living in. And Dallas and I drove up on this building. Great, big, beautiful, white church building. Here's the sanctuary with a Sunday school wing going off to the left. And over here on the right hand side is a separate fellowship hall. I about swallowed my gums. The pastor and the trustee came and they opened the building up for me. We walked in and there's red carpets. There wasn't a single window on one of the sanctuary walls. There were in the Sunday school rooms, but not in the sanctuary, windowless sanctuary. There's a piano. There's an organ. Place can hold at least 300, 350 people. <laughs> he takes me up. Here's the baptistry. He said, This baptistry has, listen to this, children. He said, This baptistry has a circulatory system with a heater so that you can leave it full all the time. You don't have to just fill it when you're going to have a baptismal service. Well, us being Pentecostals, us being apostolics, we don't have baptismal services per se the way a lot of churches do. We baptize the minute somebody wants to be baptized. If you come down to the altar and repent and you look up from the altar with tears in your eyes and say, Pastor, baptize me in Jesus' name. I'm going to drag you to the nearest water and baptize you right then and there. Why a Baptist church would have a baptistry with a heater and a circulatory system, I'll never know. That's something you'd normally find in an apostolic church. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Booby, that building had every stinking thing I had ever desired my entire life for a building to have. 
then we begin to talk. I only had one person who was guaranteed to come work with me in this new work I was trying to build, and that was a lady who had become a very good friend of mine, Sister Johnson. And Sister Johnson tithed uh, $200 a month, I think it was. I'm tr trying to remember. I think it was $200 a month. And he said to me, he said, all we want for rent, he said, all we want, we don't want a lot, we're not trying to make money, he said, we just want to make, you know, let the building be used so that it doesn't fall into disrepair and everything. He said, if you're okay with us coming the last Friday of every month and doing this singing like we've been doing, he said, all we want is $200 a month. Man, that Baptist almost saw a Pentecostal start shouting and running the aisles right then and there. I, I couldn't believe it. Well, Sister Johnson tithed bi-weekly. And I had already determined, the Holy Ghost spoke to me. I'm going to tell you, when God speaks to me, it's time to listen to God. God knows what He's talking about when the Lord talks. The Lord told me, I'll never forget it. He said, I want you to start the church on the first Sunday of like May or something like that. And so... When I looked at this building and everything, I knew Sister Johnson wasn't going to be getting paid on that Sunday, or for that Sunday. So there'd be no tithe coming in for that week, you know. So I said to him, I said, would you mind if I paid you the $200 every other week? You know, I'll give you $100 every other week. He said, oh, that's fine, no problem, no problem. So that's what, yeah, we'll do that. Long story short, i got to finish telling you, then I'll move on with the message. We started the church on that Sunday that God told me to start it. Had no idea where, because I asked him if I could pay him after the service, you know. And he said, yeah. And uh, all that showed up for that service was an old man who was an old retired Jesus name preacher from that community, Brother Cumby. He was like 78 years old, sweet, sweet old fellow. Sister Johnson, my brother Dallas, and a lady from town who owned a convenience store, gas station, restaurant combination thing. And I had met her at her business and told her I was starting a church, and she brought her granddaughter. So it was literally like the five of us. That was it that showed up at that service. I've never passed an offering plate at any church I've ever pastored. We put our offering plates on the front table, and at the end of the service, I instructed the people, I said, if you'd like to give an offering or pay a tithe, I said, you feel free to come forward and place it in the offering plate after the service. That's how we do our offerings in this church. And I invited everybody up front. We were in close with prayer. Everybody standing across the front of the sanctuary. And we closed with prayer. And when we got done closing with prayer, I saw Nancy, this lady who owned the, I saw her go up and put something in the offering plate. And I kind of glanced down at it. And my eyes were a lot better than they, than they are now. And I said, my God, if my eyes don't deceive me, that's a $100 bill folded in half. I said, that, that can't be what that lady just wrote. Who on earth puts $100 in an offering for the first service they ever attend? There's not but five people here, and this lady put 100 and said, no, it can't be. I must be seeing this wrong. After service, I took the offering plate, went back to my office, and I began to record the offerings and all that. She had put a $100 bill in that offering plate. I had the rent I needed. See, God showed me. You don't need Sister Johnson. I'll provide. Do you hear what I'm telling you? now. Oh, children, I want to tell you, God provides, God supplies, and then there are times when God assists. Hallelujah. And there are times when God supplies not only what we need, but simply as an expression of His love, He'll give us what we 
desire. I never one time went to the Lord and asked him for a church building that sat 350 people and had a baptistry with a circulatory system and a heater and had pews and carpeting that were red and was windowless and had a, never one time did that prayer cross my lips. But that was in my heart. That's I had talked to Sister uh, Chambers about it and I had told her, I said, honestly, I said, if I ever could build a church, here's how I build it. And I told her, you know, so God will sometimes give us the desires of our heart. Almost done today. We read in Matthew 14, 24 through 32, how that Jesus walked on the water and he called Peter out on the water to walk with him. Peter didn't have to walk out on the water. There was nothing that said Peter had to do this. But the Lord let him do it anyway. Sometimes the Lord loves us and He'll just give us the desire of our heart. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? We read in Mark chapter 4 verses 35 through 40, the calming of the sea. You remember the story. There was a great storm. And the disciples grew concerned and Jesus was asleep at the back of the boat. And they ran to Him and said, Lord, don't you care that we perish? And the Lord got up and He went to the bow of the boat and said, Peace be still. And immediately the wind ceased and there was great calm. And in the next breath, Jesus was rebuking the disciples. Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? Listen, the Lord does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. But He often is already working on our behalf, even when we're not aware of His intervention. Although the disciples came to the Lord asking Him to quell the storm, the fact is, He was preventing the ship from being overtaken by the storm even as he slept. <laughs> why do you think he rebuked him after he calmed the storm and said, why is you have no faith? He said, can't you understand? Everything was all right even when the storm was brewing. Everything when, even when everything looks the darkest, hallelujah. Even when everything looks bleak. Even when you can't see the end. Even when you're not certain of the outcome. He said, can't you see and understand? Can't you have enough faith to know that already providing for you. I'm already doing for you. I'm already taking care of things. Sure, I haven't yet given you what you'd like to see, but I've kept you thus far, hadn't I? Oh, my goodness, have mercy. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Matthew 7, 11, if ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children. How much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask Him? Psalm 37 and 4, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and He shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Notice He does not say, That which you ask for. No, no, no. He said the desires of your heart. That church building was in my heart. It never got voiced as a prayer request. But it was in my heart. And God saw my heart. And because I put Him first, because I put the kingdom of God first, Sister, Sister Chambers said, God was rewarding me. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? See, too many people want God to do for them. The only problem is, what reason has God to reward you? What reason has God got to reward you? Your faithfulness to what? Your sacrifices for what? We've had over the last 20 years dozens of people contact me here in Dallas. Over the last 20 years, dozens, not a few, dozens. And tell me, God spoke to me to come to Dallas and be part of your church. God spoke to me to come to Dallas and help you. 
God spoke to me to move to Dallas. I can help you with worship. I can help you with music. I can help you in this area. I can help you in that area. And every single time I was thrilled to death to think that we might get some help from people. And every single time except for once, every single time the people flaked out. And not a one of them showed up except for one and that one had contacted me and said if the Lord opens the door for me to move to Dallas he said I'm in the funeral uh, business I'm a undertaker if the Lord opens the door for me to come to Dallas he said I'll come and I'll play a uh, piano for your church he was a very gifted pianist and said, I'll come and play piano for your church. He was apostolic. He was uh, UPC background. Oh, bless God, hallelujah, blah, blah, blah. About a week later, he calls me and said, I received a job offer. For, I think he probably had that in the pipeline already, but, you know, we won't go there. He said, I got a job offer from a funeral home in Dallas. And I said, well, as I told you on the phone before, if you want to come to Dallas, I'll give you a place to stay. You don't have to worry about that. I said, we'll help you make the transition. We'll help you get relocated and what have you. Long story short, he came. He spent, uh, what was the booby? I, 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 I was, a couple of months. He and his dog spent a couple of months living in my apartment. I pretty much stayed because Tommy and I were together, but we were not living together at that time. I spent the majority of my time with Tommy, so he had my apartment pretty much to himself and the dog. Then I helped him get an apartment in the same complex that our apartments were in, because Tommy and I lived in the same uh, complex, but we were in different apartments. And we got we helped him get an apartment in that complex. He came to church twice during the entire time he lived in my apartment. He kept saying, oh, I have to work, I have to work, I have to work. Came to church twice. After I helped him get an apartment of his own, he said, your church is a joke. You don't even have that many people. He said, I'm not, I'm not going to do nothing with your church. Blah, blah, blah. And he never came again. This was many, many years ago, so our work was still very new in Dallas at the time. I don't think we were in town more than two years or maybe three at the time. Well, I'll tell you something. People want God to bless them, but when the Lord speaks to them to do something, they sure enough don't do it. Well, i got news for you, honey. God don't bless people who don't do what the Lord asks them to do. If you got something in the bank, if you've got something to the Lord's account, God ain't going to owe you nothing. He'll bless you. He'll shower favor down upon you. He will do for you because you have earned it. If we put the will of God, if we put the kingdom of God first, if we delight ourselves also in the Lord, He will give us the desires of our heart. But there's a condition too many believers fail to see the blessings of God as blessings because He offers us assistance rather than substitution. Rather than responding to our demands, He simply supplies assistance. In our want... The Lord may send us more hours or overtime rather than a miraculous check in the mail or an unexpected gift. God has not called us to laziness or slothfulness. He desires that we learn to be productive human beings. An individual who doesn't work, the Word of God says, ought not to eat. But a person who has done all they can do should not suffer or go without simply because they're incapable of doing all they need to do to meet all their needs. So today, before we start making demands, we first need to consider whether that for which we are asking is a need or a want. We also then need to consider if it falls within the will of God for our lives. And lastly, we need to examine our priorities. 
and make perfectly sure that the kingdom of God and living right are first and foremost in our thinking. If all of these things line up, we can know that the Lord has heard our prayer and the answer is already on the way. Hallelujah. Supply and demands. Glory.